All right, today we're starting what's gonna be a six part project on redoing the interior of this vehicle. And as you can see, I have done some work to the interior and it's gone, well, not so great. We're gonna pull everything out of this Jeep except the dash and we are going to start putting in some insulation. All right, we've got most of the stuff out of the vehicle now, all the, you know, the miscellaneous junk, but we've got two big things that we need to get out of here. We need to get the panels out, and that includes side panels, C pillar, B pillar, and the stuff that holds your headliner on if you want to put insulation on the roof, which I recommend doing. It's pretty much a tin can. Then we need to get those back seats out. So what we're gonna need, a drill, uh, preferably a ratcheting screwdriver and then a whole bunch of different heads Torx heads flat heads and Phillips heads and that's because the only thing more surprising than finding two bolts that mismatch on a Jeep is finding two bolts that match now in your stock Jeep you're gonna have a tire carrier here or here depending on if you have a right or left hand drive or if you're in Europe in America in America your tire came over here bolted into these two bolts here. You did not, you should not have come with any of these mounts, gun rack, or this JCR cubby. Don't have to take the JCR cubby out if you have one to take these off. Don't have to take the fire extinguisher off, but we are going to have to take these off of the vehicle. So you can take your stuff out, unclip them if you follow along. Check out the video I did. I'll link that up here and now those are gone these bolts and pretty much every exposed bolt you are going to find you're going to have to take off now like i said they will be an assortment of sizes and types these right here are torx and the two screws the two bolts that hold your seat on those are both a 14 mil get a ratcheting wrench pull those two bolts out seats will just lift right out now if this is your first time pulling your jeep apart or a vehicle apart i do recommend you keep a bucket every nut and bolt and if you're a bit more novice or cautious or concerned about misplacing bolts isn't the biggest deal but you don't want to put something that's too long into a spot and possibly hit something electrical or the floorboard or whatever's behind it you don't always <laughs> It, it, there is some caution you should have. For removing this back panel here, uh, if you have carpet, you're going to need to remove this whole thing. So there's six screws here and two bolts. These are, I believe, a 10 or 12 or 14 under here to remove this center pin out for your upper hatch. I don't have carpet. I will be installing carpet this summer, but not right now. So you don't need to take these two out, but you need, or these four, you need to take this outer screw out on both sides to be able to remove your side panels though. So here, these bolts, these screws, all up along here, just start pretty much taking everything apart uh, because that's the point we're gonna get. So I'm gonna start unscrewing these. Now I've got the screws out of this upper ridge here and I just want to show you, you kind of got to slide and lift like that. As you see, these lips kind of catch, they're meant to catch. That's how you put them back on, but don't expect it to just fall. It might fall on you, but it should have to slide off those. Now. Whether you have a two-door or a four-door, all you have to do to get the back seat of your Cherokee out is these bolts right here. Now, some come with a little plastic spacer. On my other side, you'll see it. And you want to make sure not to lose that, and you want to remember which side it was on. Now, that's because these vehicles were not made 
super accurately in the measurement department, which don't worry, isn't important with vehicles. And so that's how they uh, centered the seat. Now, here's the spacer I was talking about. Mine came on the passenger side. So be sure not to lose this if you're planning on reinstalling your back seat. Now this is the hinge that your uh, the back of your rear seat folds into. Now these three are Torx number six, I believe. I don't know. Torx six, so these three bolts on both sides. And don't try and use something other than a Torx. Just go out and get yourself a set of Torx if you don't have them. T-O-R-X, T-O-R-Q-U-E, I don't know. Torx. Easiest way, in my opinion, of taking this out is to make sure both your front seats are pushed as far forward and leaned forward. And then reach down here, push this hinge up. And then on the other side is just a peg that will pull right out. Now for removing the cap here. You just pull this down, kind of pinch on the sides. It's got four little clips. And then there should just be a retention circle on this. Now, your overhead handles are pretty much the same Torx. They have the cover clip, or they should have a cover clip. And you just kind of pull up with your finger or a flathead, pull up here, should pop off. There should be a little attachment that holds them on there, but apparently neither of mine work. And then they're the same Torx 6 or whatever size these are. They're the same, and you should have one, two, three. Driver doesn't get one because two hands on the wheel. Also on the two door models, there are two hidden screws up here at the B pillar. And so you have to pull this to the side, run a, a Phillips head in here to get one and two screws out so you can pull this whole system forward and access your rear tire well and we can get all the insulation on here and i'm even throwing some insulation in here just to help stop the sound from coming through from the outside so i'm going to take the seat belts out for the rear passenger area with a torx 50 and then we're going to move on front now we're up here with the visors and to remove them it takes one two three four Phillips head bolts or screws so we're just going to use our hand screw take these four out on both sides take the last Torx of those out and this should start falling apart but intentionally falling apart now to remove the A pillar on your passenger side pull your glove box down and take this screw out it's holding a piece of plastic down so that's a little hidden screw you need to take out well, we've got the B pillar or the A pillar off. To get the A pillar off, passenger side was just that little hidden bolt. Now the hidden bolt on this side goes much further down, and you have to take this bolt off and that bolt off to get a little bolt behind here because the A pillar over here goes all the way down. So, one bolt, two bolt, three bolt. So before you can wedge this out of there, you have to kind of weasel these little Christmas tree mounts out. And I actually only have one left. Now for most of you, removing your center console is gonna be a little bit different than mine. And if it's not, I'd be very confused because I made this uh, in my garage as a senior in high school. Ammo can, pieces of wood, three hubs from, you know, random hubs that I got from Discount Tire. It should be, uh, open the hood up. I think there's four bolts in there to pull the panel out. And I think the plastic raises up when you put this into third and you have to put this into the lowest setting it can be to lift that out. Take the T off your handle, which by the way, is my favorite part of Cherokee, is just the T shifter. And you just kind of pull up and it'll do that. Now if you need a shift, just push down on that thing. That's what this button does.
Now you don't have to remove the seats to do the insulation on the transmission tunnel, but it'd be a lot easier at least removing one of them because there's a whole lot of stuff coming under this driver's seat you're going to insulate. Not as much ground, it kind of dives straight off on the passenger side, so it would be doable, but we're just going to take them both out. So up here you have a half inch drive, one, two, three bolts, and then slide your seat forward. And there is a 11 16th drive fits right over that. So those four in the seat will just lift right out. Now to take the door panel off, all you need is a flat head or if you really care that much, a Christmas tree puller or a tab puller. They sell them at O'Reilly's or you can make one yourself. And Phillips head. Yeah, Phillips head. And you need five screws to take out. Un, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco. You need to pop off your crank, which I thought I could do at this angle and I can't. And then all the Christmas trees that ring this. After you remove the two bolts there, this should come right off. And then you have one, two, three. Mine appears a little broken. So I think I just have two. Pop this off. Just get your two fingers behind it and yank real hard. Now, like I said, if you really care and you have a nicer conditioned vehicle, I'd recommend getting a Christmas tree puller. But if not, like myself, you can just simply run it, run this flathead between until you feel the tree and then use it to push against the metal and it'll pop it right out. Do that all the way around. Slide it back and off. Now you can see right here and here was the ridges holding this on. Once you have as much of the glue and old tape stripped off as possible, you take a degreaser, simple green, some type of cleaning material. Now if you have an electronic uh, crank, you're going to want to be a little bit more careful. I've got a metal, simple, manual crank, and so I'm just going to simple green, spray, and I've already cleaned a bit, but you want to get as much loose material off of the vehicle as possible because that's what's going to interrupt the bond between insulation and your vehicle. And we're going to repeat this cleaning process, spray, brush, wipe, everywhere that we are going to apply this. So for me, that is the door, the other door, the roof, the wheel wells, this panel, and the transmission tunnel. Now here we have everything we're going to need for putting in this installation. We have the rollers of five different sizes. Now this came in a pack on Amazon and I highly recommend getting it. It makes pressing this into all the crevices and getting a firm connection between the glue and the material you're bonding to, preferably a vehicle. Don't know why you'd be here if you weren't. Very easy. Now, what we have here are the two different sizes I'll be using. Now this is the 150 mil thermal car heat and sound insulation and that is our heat and cool 50 mil insulation or uh, 80 mil insulation and as you can see it's got this diamond ridge pattern it's got more of a metallic thickness this is a much lighter softer foam they serve two mostly different functions now this is going to be your base layer for everywhere that gets heat such as your transmission tunnel or your ceiling you're going to overlap that then with your sound if you'd like you don't need it, but it's gonna make your ride a lot nicer. Now there are areas that are gonna get no heat and you can, if you've got the money and time, just put this everywhere as a base layer, which is what Noiko recommends, but of course they want you to spend the money. Or you can simply use the sound insulation like I have here over the areas that only have sound and no heat coming through, such as your rear wheel wells or your rear trunk area. Now, a simple application of just this is already much quieter than having nothing and it'll help deaden the sound and improve the quality on the inside of the vehicle or so they say we'll figure it out once we've got everything back together for some of the larger areas like your general trunk space right here you'll be able to just lay down entire panels without having to do any cutting or sizing or fitting it to the curves and shapes of your vehicle but for a good amount of the space you're going to need yourself a nice sharp little box knife. You can go to most Dollar Trees, Harbor Freights, whatever, 
pick a set of these up for a buck or two and they will help a lot for getting your fitment in these nice curves where the flat square doesn't want to bend that way so it's going to try and pick up off of the vehicle and you're not going to get a good contact between the glue and the metal so if you put little cuts in that you can come by and tape back over with your scraps so that you get a full insulation barrier you'll allow the contact of the glue to the metal to be a lot better gaps like these when you come back do it at the end you don't want to be cutting up perfectly big good size ones just to fill those little gaps because then you might have to fill the gaps later on so big stuff first little stuff last for lining up areas like this where there may be a little bit of a gap you don't want to cut off a half inch so you can move this little section to meet but you don't want to leave a gap so that's the sort of stuff that when you're done you've got scraps left over from the areas that you cut out you come back and you lay that over and then you come back again with the sound insulation, lay it over that, and you'll get a really firm, solid shield from heat, sound, and cold leaking through your floorboard or your ceiling. So remember, you can always cut more. So start small, and if you have to cut more away to fit through something, that's fine. But you can never really add stuff back unless you're welding. So using the pre-line we cut, and then push that down and see where we're at. Now I need to cut a bit more on this side. We've got our little panel and that's perfect. So remember, cut less and you might not have to cut as much. You cut too much, you might have to get a whole new panel. Now remember and be sure before you start laying the stuff down to pull any cables you can out of the way. You do not want to trap these cables under there. I found that cutting the panel into a smaller workable section was far easier as once you took the backing paper off, the rubber would want to cling to any which section that it touches, even if that's not where you want it to be. So simply cut it into workable sections so you can apply that at once and put it all in the right place so you don't get any big bubbles or poor contact or get it stuck on things you don't want it stuck on. Then you can move on and yes it might take a bit more time but it's going to be better in the long run. They come in a set of five with different sizes everything from one and a half inch to eighth inch. You really want to press all of these diamonds out to get a really strong contact and some of these blades like this one which is really helpful for getting a large area won't get into small spots like under this bracket, like under that bracket. But this thinner one, it'll reach in there and it'll get you that really good contact you're looking for. And while it's not super duper duper important on the lower areas like this, when you're working, when it's holding itself up, up on the ceiling, you're gonna want every single piece of contact to be well done. The metal that is this material is uh, very sharp apparently. I just uh, cut my thumb open, so you should probably wear gloves and all safety materials. I'm gonna go uh, take care of that. It's not a Jeep project if you don't bleed a little bit. So when you're applying this, you're gonna wanna do about six or seven rolls per every you know inch, because you wanna get these bubbles as flat and impossible to see as, po as, as you can. And I like to switch between the thicker rollers and the thinner rollers to get into certain crevices. After hand applying, trying to push out all the bubbles, then I push it into all the ridges to conform as much as I possibly can with just the port force of my hand. And then I use these, the various ridges, to get the most area in the flat areas. And when I want to get into these ridges, I use the smaller one. I do recommend using a glove after cutting my thumb open. and. Even after that, when I was finished up in the day, I realized I had a bunch of small, tiny paper cuts from this, uh, from this sheet metal that seems very soft, but cuts you deep, and you don't even really notice it. Um, I only noticed one of the, like, 12 that I had on my hand. So, wear protection. Now, the application of the secondary layer, the 150 mil sound deadener, is slightly different. Now, this is a lot lighter, so it's not really going to 
detriment the application of of the adhesive bond between the primary metal and the base blade. Now for this upper layer, you want to be careful to push into the crevices before you lay it flat across as this material doesn't stretch as well as the base material did. And so hand roll it, hand push it, and then go back over everything with the roller. Just try not to rip it up, be gentle, a little bit slower on this process, and you'll figure it all out. To fit the spare tire indentation on the rear well, I'm gonna line this as far back up as it will be flat. And simply using the blade in a fully extended way, draw it across the metal to get the proper curve. For attempting to insulate the door, you have a couple options. Now you see there are pretty large gaps, but there's also a whole bunch of small holes. Now some of these small holes, those are actually where the grommets, the little plastic Christmas trees that hold the interior panel onto the door, go in. And we cannot obstruct those at all. Another thing to consider when you're coming in here and deciding which mechanism or which uh, Deciding which manner you want to insulate this, whether the strips or the whole section, is that if you ever need to uh, replace, repair, or inspect any of the internal parts, such as the window crank, whether you have an electric or manual, you're going to probably have to cut through this insulation. So if you do smaller sections or bits, you might not have to cut or damage as much if you come in here to fix it. Uh, if you do the full thing, you may or may not have to cut up or damage more of the material and it'll be easier for you to replace the smaller sections rather than it would be for you to replace the entire thing just some food for thought so just be careful when you're applying these clean it down well and do what you think will work best because i'm not an acoustic scientist and people go to school for you know a long time to learn about that stuff and i didn't Now for putting everything back together, it's a pretty simple process of doing everything you did in reverse, starting from the last thing you took out and going back to the first. The only difficult part is if, like me, you put all of the nuts and bolts in a single bucket, some of them you'll know where they go, and some of them you'll have to just simply start guessing with size, thread pitch, and length of the screw or nut or bolt to figure it out. But go slow, go easy, and start putting things back. And if you have a couple extra screws, bolts, at the end of it, just hang on to them, I'm sure you'll figure out where they go eventually. So I'm just out here driving on the state highway, and as you can see on the decimal reader, I'm registering about an average of 70, high 70s decibels. That's even when I'm accelerating up to 3,000, 3,500 on the tachometer. The loudest time was during startup, and I would wager, just from what I'm hearing, a majority of the sound is coming through the firewall, an area I did not insulate. So for the most part, even without the headliner, without the back seats, this is a huge difference in just the general sound, how much road noise is coming through, and how much exhaust, transmission, and engine noise gets into the cab. And the sound I am hearing, rattling from stuff in the back, that's because we haven't put everything back together. And 
some of the stuff is going to come back together after we put a new headliner in and uh, that video should be coming in a week or so so thank you for coming along remember like subscribe comment follow me on instagram at some guy insta page and uh, if some guy can do it you can do it